This is MPB News. Hi, this is Karen Brown. Thanks for checking out the Mississippi Edition podcast. If you like what you hear, click subscribe, hit like, or leave us a comment if your app has that feature. Then find other MPB podcasts by searching MPB Think Radio on your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks. Good morning. It's 8.30 on Friday, October 23rd. I'm Karen Brown, and this is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. On today's show, as coronavirus transmission intensifies, healthcare professionals prepare for a rising trend in hospitalizations. Then a Gulf States newsroom special report examines how families are preparing for a different Halloween. Plus, absentee voting has been a central focus this election. We check in at the local level to see how officials are handling the final days of election season. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hospitalizations in Mississippi are spiking as transmission of the coronavirus continues to worsen, up 44 percent since the beginning of October. That's according to data released by the Department of Health. Reported cases of COVID-19 are also on the rise with 958 new cases reported yesterday. In an effort to keep the hospital system from being overwhelmed, Governor Tate Reeves has issued an executive order placing 10 percent capacity requirement on health care facilities across Across the state. If hospitals cannot maintain 10% of their capacity for COVID 19 patients, they must delay elective procedures. Dr. Roderick Givens with the Mississippi State Medical Association says cases and hospitalizations decreased during the period of statewide mask mandate. He tells our Kobe Vance the recent provisions are a viable way for hospitals to continue operations while ensuring beds for future COVID 19 patients. COVID essentially is a uh, airborne, highly contagious disease. And so the, the fact that um, while somewhat controversial, I think the mask mandates uh, did uh, cause the, the uh, number of cases to uh, drop. Um, and I think with the increase that is uh, happening now as far as cases, it's prompting some action again to at least try to mitigate uh, this uh, process. And so the governor has uh, issued an order requiring hospitals to reserve 10 to 10% of their capacity for COVID-19 patients. Um, is that going to be enough? Uh, what are some things hospitals need to be doing now to prepare uh, as, as case numbers and hospitalizations in- inevitably increase? Right. Well, that that might be enough. You know, really the reason for uh, the capacity is in the event that somebody comes in, say, through the emergency room, you can at least take care of that patient until they have to be transferred to a higher level of, of care. Uh, and what uh, the reason for the limited bed space is so that essentially hospitals that are trying to basically ramp up, do some, a bunch of outpatient procedures and so forth, that might also require hospitalization. What you want to do is keep it where if a patient came to the emergency room, that, that hospital at least has capacity to take care of that patient, as opposed to losing bed space because you've done uh, some outpatient procedures that were elective. And so that mandate essentially just says that every hospital is going to at least have 10% uh, capacity so that when that patient uh, with COVID comes in, they can be immediately seen. So really, it's, it, it tem- tends to pretty much slow down sort of elective procedures in order to just hold bed space for that COVID patient. So it, it's a smart idea. That works, or at least that's, I, I agree 100%. I think 10% is at least a reasonable start. And now early on in the process, you know, hospitals were required to cease all elective procedures, um, period. And then later on, it was uh, elective procedures that required an overnight stay. Uh, what right. what damage does that do to hospitals? Because it takes well, away some revenue? Yeah, oh, definitely. Uh, imp- Hospitals make a significant amount of their income with outpatient elective procedures. And essentially, uh, with the way, uh, even with Obamacare, as it's called, you know, the trend was trying to keep people out of the hospital. Uh, and instead of, you know, like in the old days, somebody would have surgery and they'd stay in the hospital for a week 
before they went home. Well, the trend now is to do that outpatient, if you can. Say, you know, gallbladder and so forth. Uh, overnight stay and then discharge out. A lot of procedures are laparoscopic and that sort of thing. And so really that is, you know, cheaper uh, than having a patient stay in for a full week or whatever for recovery. Now, when you shut down, you know, elective procedures, you're then shutting down a significant income screen. And so that has impacted hospitals across the board. And so uh, with some of the um, uh, rescue funds that came through the government, that at least sort of helped to um, uh, alleviate some of that economic burden because basically with hospitals shuttering um, uh, outpatient procedures, you know, they're losing, you know, 10, 20, 30 percent of the revenue, which and hospitals are already, even though hospital bills are high and people scream about them, operate at a very, very low profit margin. And so if you knock out 30 percent of your income and a, a strong hospital may only make one to two to even five percent um, profit or, you know, uh, income uh, above uh, expenses, that can put a hospital in trouble really quickly. And so what are some conversations hospitals are having right now? Um, and also, like, what can Mississippians expect in the next few weeks as we uh, begin to see these cases increase? Well, hospitals are basically bracing for the second wave, and so uh, they're getting uh, staffing ramped up. They're uh, uh, looking at their PPE supplies, going ahead and making orders uh, for that. They're also taking it to taking into account the fact that we may be, and, and it's going to be area by area. Some areas may be hit harder than others, but they recognize that 10% uh, bed space availability uh, possibly being a requirement, and so they're already looking at uh, potentially opening up you know, additional beds or if they've got some units that have uh, essentially been inactive. Uh, opening those and at least having bed space so that they can at least continue to uh, do the operative uh, procedures as well as uh, cover the um, uh, need for uh, COVID patients um, should they come in. And so that that's sort of the proactive thing that I can tell you every hospital is doing, ours included. And so what can Mississippians do to try to help hospitals out in this situation and prevent the spread of the disease as much as possible? There are basically four things that I recommend that I've sort of said from the beginning of this, you know, uh, pandemic back in January or February. Uh, one is to wear a mask. The other thing is uh, cleanliness, hygiene. So washing your hands frequently, using hand sanitizer. The other thing would be the obvious thing, uh, avoiding crowded indoor spaces. And while we all want to get together and uh, congregate and so forth, it's just not a good idea. Or if so, you need to physically distance. They call it social distance, but it's physically distance. Uh, and then the fourth thing is, is if you're feeling ill, if you're just not feeling good, don't intermingle in the general public. And so those are essentially four, I would say, sort of basic things to look at. It's not a matter of restricting freedom or anything. For me, it's a matter of this is how you control a contagious airborne disease, and that's how you protect your fellow Mississippian. Dr. Roderick Givens with the Mississippi State Medical Association. There are now 113,081 reported cases of COVID-19 since March 11th, with 3,231 related deaths. Coming up, a Gulf States newsroom special report examines how families are preparing for a different Halloween. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. 
The coronavirus pandemic affects virtually everything, and that includes Halloween. It's such a big issue across the South that recently when a girl emailed New Orleans Mayor LaToya Cantrell asking if the holiday was canceled, the mayor went on the record at a press conference. We're not canceling Halloween, and it will move forward slightly different. However, we will be moving forward. Families or families everywhere are trying to figure out how to make celebrating safe. From WBHM in Birmingham, Andrew Yeager reports. Jason Noah has one of those houses in a suburban Birmingham neighborhood. As in, right now, emerging from his flower bed, there's a pirate ship piloted by talking skeletons. This is no pleasure cruise, mate. You're in for a very scary time. We have fog machines in the flower bed as well, so at night the fog comes out and kind of actually adds to it a lot. Halloween's a big deal in his neighborhood. The first year that I was here, we started out in the house with the door closed, and, and by the end of the night we were sitting outside with the door open just because there was so much traffic, and so it gets to be pretty busy. Noah estimates 300 people typically come by on a Halloween night. During a pandemic, crowds like that are a no-no. Across town, Shilpa Gagar began having misgivings this summer as Alabama's case counts surged. She and her husband work in medicine and see the effects of the pandemic firsthand. There's no way that things were going to be under control enough for us to have what you would consider a normal Halloween. But her kids insisted, and she's right there with them. I'm determined. It is my favorite holiday, and I'm like, there's going to be some way that we can celebrate this. Public health officials say those big trunk or treat events and large indoor parties, that's not going to work. But Luann Woodward, the dean of the University of Mississippi School of Medicine, says you can trick or treat safely if you follow the recommendations we've heard throughout the pandemic. Hand hygiene, wear a mask, keep a distance, um, all those things would be extra important. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention also recommends following a one-way path, with individually wrapped bags of goodies that kids can grab without getting too close. Jason Noah in Birmingham says he'll skip hanging out in the yard with neighbors. Shilpa Gagar says her neighborhood is discussing putting candy bags on tables at the end of driveways. For her, masking is critical. Even if you have a little bit of clustering, if everybody's wearing masks, so that should kind of counteract some of that. Some traditions, though, are on hold altogether. Llewellyn Berger is something of a local legend in New Orleans, in 2003, she put a single skeleton outside of her home. It's now grown into a pun-infused display of more than 80. There's Scary Poppins, or Little Dead Riding Hood. Back in April, Berger knew several people who died or became seriously ill from the virus, and a lawn of skeletons seemed insensitive. Plus, in recent years, tour buses started stopping by to take in the site. So we do have very large crowds. I didn't want to be responsible nor liable for passing on COVID, if that be the case. So she canceled the display. But a few weeks ago, while dwelling on the disappointment, inspiration struck. With the help of her church's music director and a nod to the musical Hamilton, she created an online video. We'll be back in 21 when we all can gather have some fun. In the end, Berger put up three skeletons, the original one plus two based on the musical. It's a far cry from the usual spectacle, but that distance from tradition has become the norm for celebrating in a pandemic. In Birmingham, I'm Andrew Yeager. Coming up, absentee voting has been a central focus this election. We check in at the local level to see how officials are handling the final days of election season. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. Hey, parents, students, and teachers. There's a new channel from Mississippi Public Broadcasting. That's right. MPB Classroom TV is available now. This new channel will help Mississippi students learn, even while at home. MPB Classroom TV features great teachers and engaging programs for students in pre-K through 12th grade. To learn more about how you can watch MPB Classroom TV, visit education.mpbonline.org. 
This podcast is a local production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting and depends on the support of listeners like you. If you can, please donate today at mpbonline.org. And thanks. This is Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. I'm Karen Brown. Election officials in Mississippi are preparing to manage new requirements this election season. One new provision allows voters to cure rejected absentee ballots. These ballots are usually dismissed due to a perceived signature mismatch. The new requirement prevents absentee ballots from being rejected for such an error. A second provision is for curbside voting. While this method of voting has always been available, the change ensures those with COVID symptoms can safely vote without endangering others at polling locations. Crystal Starling is the Alcorn County Circuit Clerk. She tells our Desiree Frazier her office is prepared to manage these changes. A, an absentee ballot is rejected for that reason, then within 24 hours, we will have to contact that absentee voter by first phone call, email, and then uh, certified mail as a last resort if we cannot get a hold of them another way to come in and correct it. Not very often or many absentees ever rejected for mismatch signatures, uh, so majority of our ballots it's not. It shouldn't be a big majority of the ballots. So you're not concerned that that's going to take away from what you have to do, pretty much. No, ma'am. I mean, we will we will do anything that we have to do in order to follow the law, and no matter how many there is, we will contact the voters. The other instance uh, was to expand curbside voting on election day, so that people with COVID symptoms can vote. Your thoughts on that? I'm thankful we have curbside voting, and that is available to anyone with COVID. We have instructed our poll workers that if anyone does come up with any kind of symptoms, that you never turn a voter away under any circumstances, especially being sick, that they are allowed to vote curbside, which we vote curbside in their vehicle. And so the two poll workers will be taking the tablet out to them to vote. We have purchased additional PPE along with what the Secretary of State's office has given us. And one of the additional PPEs that we have for poll workers is hospital gowns. So we have instructed our poll workers, if someone is voting curbside due to COVID, to wear a hospital gown, a face mask, face shield, and gloves to make sure and dispose of all of that and sanitize, plus wash their hands when they come back in after voting that COVID voter. Any concerns about this for you? No, ma'am. Um, I believe that we have taken every necessary step to make sure that we allow the poll workers enough PPE to remain safe, but that we allow voters the right to vote because we never want to deny anyone the right to vote. How is absentee voting going in your county? It is going very well. We have had more than usual, but not as many as I had expected. So we're just a little above average, but it is a steady flow, and we will definitely make absentee voting history as far as how many we do cast at the end of it. Crystal Starling, we really appreciate your time and speaking with us and what you're doing to help Mississippians cast their ballots. Well, thank you very much. The change is part of an agreement between the Secretary of State's office and the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. The attorneys filed a lawsuit to expand absentee voting because of the coronavirus. The case was dismissed this week in federal court. While the pandemic might be affecting how people vote, the stakes of the election are driving record turnout. Statewide absentee ballot requests have already surpassed 2016 levels. And in some places like Jackson County, the voter rolls are growing as more more Mississippians registered to take part in this pivotal election. Danny Glasscox is an election commissioner in Jackson County. Normally in an election like this, we have around 4,000 or 4,000 plus. They've already voted over 6,000 and they're still lining up every day. So we're, we're expecting at least somewhere between seven to 8,000 absentee voters. And we've never, ever had that many. How is it for requesting mail-in ballots? 
Uh, they're they're being bombarded. We're getting. I had thirty messages on my phone one Monday asking for absentees. Of course, I can't issue an absentee. So I actually changed my message on my phone to to tell who I was, what I what I did, and I put on there. If you're calling for an absentee ballot, you must call the circuit clerk's office at this number. And I gave them the number. But I get emails every day wanting to know how they can vote absentee. And of course, I feel obligated to send them a message back and say you must call the circuit clerk's office, and this is the number. Do you feel like you got the staffing to do what you need to do? Oh yeah, yeah. We 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 have we're we're well staffed and they're well trained. Uh, the only problem we're going to have is if someone panic during the day, which I hope they won't, because most of our people are are people that worked before. Uh, we have some new people, and of course uh, everybody does, I'm sure, because some of our people that that usually work, most of our people are, are older people. And they're afraid to have this virus. But our people are going to be protected. We're going to give them gloves, a sanitizer. They'll have face masks. They will also have face shields. And they were instructed not to touch anything that the voters touched without sanitizing. And the reason we, the reason we, you know, emphasize the food service gloves is we did a lot of research. They're they're not, there are no latex in them. Uh, they don't have any powder in them, so nobody should have an allergic reaction to them. So we asked them to use those to touch our equipment so that we don't have to sanitize it between every single voter. Well, how and do you we, know that they haven't touched stuff with those gloves? Because we issue them gloves when they walk in the door. And as a matter of fact, somebody even asked, well, what if they've already got gloves? Well, that's fine. We want them to wear our gloves over their gloves because our gloves are brand new. Nobody's touched anything. Uh, so we have we have at least one person in every single precinct to do nothing but personal protective equipment duties. The person at the door is going to make sure that you have your hands sanitized right then. Of course, if they refuse that, we can't force them. We're going to offer them a mask if they don't have one. We're going to offer them the food service gloves, and we're going to emphasize to them, please wear these because it will not only protect you, it will protect you from the person that voted ahead of you, and it will protect the person that's going to vote behind you. Approximately how many voters do you have in your county? Oh, right now, probably about uh, 96,000. They have been registering like crazy. So you had a lot of unregistered voters? We have a lot of unregistered voters. You're absolutely right. We have over 140,000 people in Jackson County. And when we first started this back in the primary, uh, our count uh, went up, started going up pretty heavy. Right now, we have 96,821 voters. And back about, uh, let's see, back before the primary, we had about 90,000. So we've already gained over 6,000 people that's registered. So you're busy. <laughs> we've been very busy. As a matter of fact, we normally work three days a week. But we're having to work just about every day now to stay caught up. There's a lot of behind-the-scenes work. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We keep the voter rolls clean. That's our job. We removed uh, deceased voters. We removed people that's moved out of the county or the state. Uh, we update information constantly, and uh, it's a it's a full time job actually. But we can see by statute we can only work so many days a year, and it depends on the number of people that lives in the county. And for us, we can work 150 days a year. And if we do an extra election, which we do the primary election to help the parties, that allows us to 50 more days. So we can actually work 200 days. Interesting. This is new information to me. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. R nobody really knows what we do. Uh, we're required by law to train every single year. We have to go to certification training. We have to be certified. Uh, we're the only elected officials other than a judge that has to do that. You're confident this year will go well? I hope it does. Uh, we. This is not my first time to go through it, and 16 was pretty bad, but this one's going to be worse. I've never seen so many people come out to vote absentee. And I'm assuming it's because they're afraid to go to the polls. But those polls are going to be a lot cleaner than Walmart, trust me. Danny Glasscox is an election commissioner in Jackson County. In a statement, the Secretary of State's office says they're working to ensure it's as safe as possible for people to cast their ballots on November 3rd. This has been Mississippi Edition on MPB Think Radio. If you're a parent on the go, but still want to stay informed about your children's education, subscribe to Mississippi Education Connections podcast.